hopefully people who are listening that are from Brisbane know where Juliet Street is and Cornwall Street is. Uh, over that area, a um, explorer came across uh, a battle of uh, Aboriginal people. And when, when these explorers would come across these, they would be... Um, dazzled and, 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 and like you know stopped in their tracks because these battles would go, go on for hours but the object of what was happening was not to kill was not to maim was not even to hurt you know so like if somebody got a scratch and was bleeding it would stop you know if somebody got hit hard on a, with a blunt object it would stop then another person would replace the other person and after it usually there was a ceremony where both groups came together you know and settled it you know, so then there wouldn't be continuing sort of conflicts for decades. You know, we managed the land to the point where anything that we did to the land wasn't irreversible. But then also the the conflicts that we had with other mobs weren't based upon land, weren't based upon slavery and taking over, and then weren't based upon coming in and killing all your people. Yama, Bo Spiram, Kumari Kuma, Marawari, part of our war, Warriors of the Aboriginal Resistance, and creator and host of Frontier War Stories, the podcast. First Nations law on this continent and across the globe lets us know that conflict does not have to lead to organised slaughter. Hey, I'm Zelda. Welcome back to Get Your Armies Off Our Bodies from Wage Peace. There are many harmonious ways that we can live together with each other and the land. Another life-affirming world really is possible and First Nations teach us plenty about what that might mean. We've just been listening to Bo Spearham. Bo works up on Yagara country in a place known as Mianjin, aka Brisbane, and for several years Bo has produced his own podcast, Frontier War Stories. We're big fans of Bo's work. Militarised harm, the business of war, began on this continent when the British invaded over 200 years ago. The slavery, dispossession, murder and destruction they brought was resisted then and it's still resisted today. If you haven't explored Frontier Wars history, Bo's podcast is a great place to start. You'll find a link in the show notes to this episode. Uh, the idea around the podcast was always wanting to know about uh, the true history of this country um, and always wanted to find out, you know, who were, uh, who, who were the many, you know, hundreds of heroes that we weren't taught about, the many Aboriginal men and women who, who fought and died and lived and survived um, what we know now as the Frontier Wars and what it took for us to survive. Um, you know, the courage, uh, the rage, you know, the, the resilience. Uh, you know, just wanted to know about those things. And um, I'd, I would have been happy with a couple of hundred listens. Um, but the podcast to date has got, you know, around 130,000 you know, 130, downloads uh, in the last two years. Um, it's been received really well. You know, it's been used in various schools, universities, TAFEs, uh, and I'm always getting messages of people saying thanks, saying, you know, I'm very inspired by your podcast. I've just gone and done my whole family research and found a perpetrator or found a victim of frontier violence. You know, people are taking it on, but then, the, you know, they're going one step further, you know, and, and analysing themselves. You know, I'll be honest, like, the podcast, you know, any, like, anything that I do is, is wholly and solely for black followers. But then it's also used as a tool to sort of educate non-Indigenous peoples as well about their own sort of history and their own emotions as well and, and how to sort of delve into that as well. And it, it's done that, which I'm very happy and humbled by. Yeah, how basis is the last 200 years of colonialism, but our creation comes from 60,000 plus years of cultivating this land, land management, management of conflicts and disputes. You know, so my understanding as an activist comes from that first and foremost so my basis doesn't come from conflict it comes from my identity and who I am that grounds me and we've got to look more in that intersection of you know our political struggles 
um, and, and see where we can align and come together. My thing is like, you know, go try something first and then have a look at how deep it goes into the land, you know, experience it, check it out and then learn more about it. Pemawai. Windradine. Tongalongata. Taranorara. Dundali. Yagan. These were some of the First Nations warriors and fighters who first resisted European colonisation in the frontier wars. And the weapons used by the colonisers? Well, for nearly 70 years they were muskets. After 1860, rifles arrived, made by companies that are still famous today, like Enfield from the UK and Winchester from the United States. So you can see the beginnings of our global weapons industry back then. That industry came in with colonisation and it is still on the front lines of colonial projects today, all over country. Auntie Sue Coleman Hasseldine is a Cockatha senior elder and a grandmother. Auntie Sue is also a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, together with the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons. She's a fierce defender of sacred sites and all that lives on her country, including the tiny little lizards known as thorny devils. When we were kids, the thorny devils used to be our friends on the mission. They were a little like a little toys. We never heard them. We'd play with them, walk around with them, then let them go. We still come across the odd one, not very often. And when we do, it's treated with the utmost respect because it's just so, so rare. The kids pick them up and carry them and hug them and and put them back again. And these little things are actually in danger. They don't understand any of that. They probably don't want to understand because it's in the way of making their millions, their billions... When are they going to realise they can't eat, drink or breathe money when it's all too late? My name is Sue Coleman Hazeldine and I'm from Suna on the far west coast of South Australia. Auntie Sue's passion for peace and for her country are well known. Her early life, less so. My story actually started on Kniba Mission. I was born there, delivered by my grandmother and I grew up my first... 10 or 11 years on that mission, they were very important um, times for me because they instilled in me my culture, my language, and everything I believe in. Um, When I was 10 years old, I was supposed to look after my new baby brother, but when my mum came home from the hospital, she didn't have the baby with her. So I was so upset they told me the baby had died and, you know, they didn't have a funeral, so where is this baby? Then they told me that the baby was adopted out by a nice white family. But, you know, that was a part of my life that took something away. Mm-hmm. And um, it was the welfare system that said to my mum at the time, if you don't sign this baby over for adoption, we're going to take the kids you already got. Anyway, Mum signed the baby over under duress. And, you know, like another year or something down the track, the welfare took us away from her anyway. So I I don't know how you'd describe that. But they took us away from Mum after making her sign that boy over. When I was taken away from my mother, she wasn't allowed to have any connections with me. But I found her when I was 14 years old. I found out where she was living. So I just went to her house and she was scared that the police would come because she wasn't supposed to have any contact with me. But the old German man she was living with at the time, he supported me. And then mum had to give in because she was outvoted. And I just didn't take any notice of any welfare people or any police or anybody. I'd found my mother. So I stayed with her. Um, Once I found mum, something gave, I don't know, but it released me, I guess to be able to go back to country. And I've hated 
authority, never never conformed to it, because they were the people I looked at that was ruining my life. Stealing my childhood. Stealing my mother. My brother and two brothers and two sisters. Separating us. Anybody that had authority was a target for me. A bit of context for our international listeners. This is a story of the Stolen Generations. It was government policy on this continent to remove Aboriginal children and place them with white families. Thousands and thousands suffered under this policy. It's not unique to Australia. And here, as elsewhere, in many ways it continues with punitive police and child protection policies. I got married, had six kids of my own, I lost one. And um, I didn't know what was happening to me, something was going on, I lost a lot of weight. And one doctor finally um, checked me for thyroids. So they found that I had an overactive thyroid. And when they removed that, that was cancerous, so they took the whole lot out. And I needed to find answers for this. I knew it wasn't right because our people didn't have cancer and stuff back in the day. Of course, when I was a toddler, the Maralinga bombs were happening. And I would have been eating the dust like every other child in Australia at the time. From colonial rifles in the frontier wars to the biggest weapons ever made. In the 50s and 60s, Australia's government allowed the United Kingdom to conduct seven large-scale nuclear tests at the Maralinga and nearby emu field sites in South Australia. They also ran a large number of smaller tests, all highly dangerous. That's in the same geographic area as Auntie Sue's country, Cookada country. The UK and Australian governments said the site was uninhabited. First Nations peoples tell a different story. Um, when my grandchildren started to get sick, my son was 45 years old, triple up bypass. And I, I found out since that radiation poisoning can cause that as well. But it's probably all started to come down through my genes and my husband's, because he was around Sejuna at the same time. So we probably passed down whatever bad genes or whatever to the children and then granddaughter, no thyroid. Um, great granddaughter, what happened to you, baby? You know, born deformed. So I started attending the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance meetings and through Dr Bill Williams he's passed away now but he guided me through a lot of things he told me that the thyroid is you know one of your first defenses against radiation poisoning um, he was a very caring person how can you describe somebody who took you seriously when you had a problem and talked you through it he didn't have to he could have just left me with the, the, the bare answers to the questions, but he didn't. He actually helped personally. So how do you describe somebody like that? But thank you, you know. Hmm. Because all the years after Maralinga, we didn't know. Never knew. And through that one man and Anfa, we found out a lot. All of these things that I've been watching coming down happening is exactly what Dr Bill said could happen, and it has, and that's just my family. I don't know about other people's families. I'm sure there's plenty of loss and grief out there that doesn't get spoken about. Um, 
Then I started to realise that all of this stuff was, you know, due to mining and greed and everything else that goes with uranium mining and bombs. And I, I decided that I was going to try and fight this, you know, stop it, mm. because we didn't want it to happen again. Maralinga is in South Australia. Somewhere in the general ballpark of the Woomera protected area, one of the most militarised zones in Australia, and it is still a government missile testing site. The Narunga Space Surveillance Base was located further south, and the Roxby Downs uranium mine out to the east. Um, my oldest great grandchild is about nine, I think, and he's starting to ask questions too, like, Nana, what will we do? If they if they bombed this place, well, well, where where will we go? Now another military initiative, with both corporate and government support, is threatening Cookata lands. A new Australian company, Southern Launch, has established two rocket launch facilities, one on the Air Peninsula and the other at Kuniba, where Auntie Sue was born. The company wants to use the land as a missile testing range for hire, right on top of all of the sacred sites and waterholes and song lines of Auntie Sue's country. It's part of the rush to profit from and militarise space. The company promotes the facility like this. The KTR extends out 145 kilometres over uninhabited areas. Customers who use the KTR can recover their rocket and payload for further testing and systems validation before launching into orbit. Southern Launch has partnered with Thales, the same French weapons maker you can hear about in our episodes about West Papua. They've also partnered with Australian rocket builders AT Space and they've received millions in taxpayer-funded grants. Keep the names of these companies in mind. They're just some of the weapons makers making enormous profit from Australia's new wave of militarism. Their plan is to build the launch. Well, they've already got some kind of a launch, a mobile launch there and they'll shoot the rockets from Kuniba and they'll go, oh, I don't know what the distance is. It's hundreds of hectares, kilometres, whatever. It's a big area. Um, we know nothing. And they've kept it that way. South Australian government gives them a 10-year lease to destroy any sites out there with immunity. You know, they, they're not even going to get fined if they... They kill a, kill a special site, they're going to get away with it. Now, out on country, we have a lot of sacred women's sites. There's some men's sites out there as well, but mostly women's sites. Like, there's one site out there we call the Mother of the Earth. And if anything happens to that one, women and children all over the world are going to suffer even more than they are now. So that they, they probably look at it as a joke and say that's just dream time crap. But that's the sort of stuff that got us brought, you know, got us growing up decently. We're look, looking after that and trying to protect places like that and there's so many out there that you, you bust up one thing, you break the backbone of a story. You know, back in the day, the old people used to walk away from the broken story, but that's not happening anymore. You don't walk away no more. You stop it and you try and mend it. No, this is another fight. You can't have it. You can't have the country. You can't destroy it. You can't massacre those animals just like you used to massacre the Aboriginal people. It's not right. And, if, you know, if we have to go and put ourselves on the line to protect country and those animals, well then, so be it. We will do it. But if they start blowing up places like the mother of the earth, how do you mend that? So there's so much out there to lose. The sad thing about it is that community has not come together. That is a very sad part of life over on the West Coast. 
Um, I, I put a lot of that down to Native Title because before Native Title came in, we were just one big, happy Aboriginal group of people. And then Native Title came in, we had to choose a tribe. Every First Nations person I know on this continent is furious about Native Title. The Native Title Act is a law that was brought in when the High Court in Australia finally recognised that Aboriginal people were custodians here, were living here, long before European invasion. This only happened in the 1990s. But what seemed like a recognition of land rights instead led to a massive new wave of dispossession. For starters, the legislation demands Aboriginal people only identify with a single tribe if they want to make a native title claim. But most Aboriginal people today share heritage across several tribes. So the system means they have to formally abandon part of who they are. Then they have to demonstrate ongoing and continuous physical connection to country. That's pretty difficult when colonisation meant forced removal and relocation of entire communities and state kidnapping of children. Many barely managed to survive genocide. Then who gets to speak in a native title claim? Who gets named on the paperwork? Who can navigate the incredibly complex legal process? And who gets left out? These things have worked to divide and distress families and communities. Native title just isn't. It's almost the opposite of land rights. It's this great divide and conquer thing again. That's mm. what it seems like. When it was first brought out, I thought, great, we're going to protect our land. I was really happy. And then I found out the real purpose for native title. You didn't have any rights under native title, no rights to say no. The only right you've got is to negotiate with miners and people like the southern launch mob, people like that. And if you say no, you've got the threat that the government's going to come in and take the land back anyway. So that threat is always there. And when they go to our people and offer them all this money, our people do take that opportunity. They do take the money because they're poor. You know, they've been poor all their lives, but so have I. But the, my richness is actually through the, the land and my culture. But I would like to see our dreams come true that we can, all, all the Aboriginal people actually, have somewhere we can call home and be safe and that let our country be safe from greed. The frontier wars might be over, but invasion is ongoing. Denial of sovereignty and refusal to give back land are forms of structural violence that underpin every sort of business on this continent. And the physical violence also continues. Kids as young as 10 are in prison. Police racism, deaths in custody, and police shootings. Kumanjai Walker was shot dead by police in his home, in his bedroom, in 2019 in Yundamu, in the Northern Territory. He was 19. He was asleep when two police officers burst in. One policeman, Zachary Rolfe, fired three bullets into his body. The first shot disabled him. The second and third shots were fired at close range into the body of a boy who had already collapsed. Kumanjai was already dead when the police handcuffed him. Rolfe was later acquitted of his murder. Yeah, Kumanjai, well, I call him Wandere, someone very special, a nephew, uh, someone loving. There were things, you know, we we did, you know, we we joked and and uh, he, he was always um, hungry for learning, you know, going out hunting and and mixing up with with elders, learning about culture and all that. Uh, he was really dear to the community. My name is Ned Hargraves Jamajinba. I'm a one tree man and um, community person and uh, community leader as, as well. After Kumanjaya's death, Uncle Ned Hargraves and the rest of the community in Yondamu and beyond have a clear demand. 
Karanjalam Bhajar, meaning ceasefire, would have one want guns in community. Because we don't want to be in fear in our own, own home. In a Muranga, Muranga, in our own country. This is how our place. And we don't want our kids to be walking around fear. The community right now, they are fighting. We have no problems. I think what had left the trauma that that is left in the community is not the same where it's before. Because the police and us the community would go out together shooting kangaroos, getting at getting bush tigers and it changed because what Sakura had done I see the police. I can't trust them anymore. I can't trust them. Even the kids say that, you know? Karanjalam Vajar, meaning ceasefire. We do not want guns. Ceasefire. No guns in community. Wage Peace heard the demand from Uncle Ned and other elders at Yundamu. Well, that resonated strongly with us. We're sick of racism and police abuse. So we connected with Uncle Ned and other elders and said, we want to work with you. We want to amplify your campaign. We want to be in active solidarity. Almost every police officer carries a gun in this country and we know who supplies those guns and the bullets. We know who profits from arming the police and where they are. Let us introduce you to Naya. From a small shop front supplying recreational shooters in Queensland, Naya managed to grow into the main handgun supplier for the Australian Police and the Defence Force. Naya also founded the Australian Missile Corporation, connecting them with the incursions on Aunty Sue's country. And now they're exporting into West Papua as well. Sniper rifles. Come on, we can talk. We can talk. But don't bring your guns and your bullets! They've already met Uncle Ned. We travelled together to their Brisbane office in October 2022. That was part of the wage peace mobilisation to disrupt the land forces arms fair in that city. This is the people in Australia make weapons to kill our people. We, we thought it was... It was uh, from overseas or something. But when I found out it was from here, it gave the community right across the central Australia a shock. What? Yeah. This is the bullets, the guns uh, that killed that young fellow. We want that company to, to stop what they're doing. Get rid of your guns. Get rid of your bullets. Stop killing our young people. We want to see justice. We want our freedom. We want to have the same equal opportunities. That's what we want. And Karangela Moita sees fire. We do not want to see another black young man or young lady shot by white man bullet. The war business. From bombs up in space to guns in community. They stop us from nurturing the world we need. But like we said, other worlds are possible. In fact, they're already here. And they have been for a long time. Just ask Auntie Sue. Our ancestors used to come down to the beach every summer. And there was... Sujuna's name is actually Jurana, which means a place to sit down by water. In summer, they'd live off the seafood. Then come winter, they would go back inland. And they would do this track every year. 
and there's lots of rock holes out there that would have had a keeper. Usually people too old to travel anymore would stay behind and look after the water holes. And if an animal fell in, they'd pull it straight out. So they were clever. They got their feed straight out too, as well as keeping the water clean for when the tribe came back. And this has been going on forever. We keep the water holes clean, but we're not living there. We believe that our people never leave you, even after they've died. They're still there. You know, people talk about guardian angels and all. They're ours. They're on hand all the time. When we're in trouble, somehow, they know us and they come and help. So, like, like with grief and loss, our kids know that, that the old people are still around. They're not gone forever. They just can't see them anymore. So that's a good way of coping with it as well. You know, you never, you never lose them. They're in the spirit world, but they're not far away. Sometimes I see them, and that's rare, but it does happen. But mostly you feel it. If, if I'm doing, not concentrating out bush, for instance, I'll get a punch in the guts and think, you know, nobody around, just bang, and then wake me up. Like somebody's not in camp or, you know, check somebody. Find out who's in trouble, and then I'll start running around and making sure everybody's okay, and if somebody's not in camp, and then there's a search start straight away, because it's pretty dangerous out there. You know, we've got this thing that we, you have to be off the rock holes before dark, because the rock holes belong to the spirits. Mm -hmm. And me and my husband had to walk reasonably close to a rock hole one night to get some bush med for a sick child. And hell, I was just talking the whole way, you know, talking to the spirits that we're just going to get a bit of bush med. And when we neared the rock hole, it was like going into a chiller. And w when we got past it to the bush med, quickly picked it on the way back, it was like walking into that chiller again, and I'm never going to do that again. It was just really horrible. But we got away with it because we were on a, on a mercy mission. Absolutely beautiful country. You freeze at night if you don't take a jacket with you because it's desert cold and cook in the summertime during the day. But it's, it's really beautiful country. It's unforgiving though if you don't obey the rules of the land. You'll die out there. This was Get Your Armies Off Our Bodies, the first season of Peace Pod, produced on unceded Aboriginal country on the continent known as Australia. All the production credits and other links can be found in the show notes, including some ways that you can engage with us because you're really inspired and you want to chat with us about this content, offer your ideas. Uh, what we'd love more than anything else is your feedback. I'm Zelda and we're Wage Peace, wishing you all a future of Earth Care, not Warfare. Anybody that had authority was a target for me.